Today on Dr. Osborne's Zone, we're talking all about pain. Whether you have joint pain, nerve pain, muscle pain, this is a show you don't want to miss. Stay tuned. You unlock this door with the key of compassion. Beyond it is another world, a world of science, a world of common sense, a world of sanity. You're moving into a land of both empathy and ethics, of nutritional knowledge and empowerment. You've just crossed over into Dr. Osborne's Zone. Welcome to Dr. Osborne's Zone. Today it's all about pain. If you struggle with pain, no matter what ails you, whether it's nerve pain, joint pain, muscle pain, this is the show for you. Now we're going to be getting into select strategies, different supplements that you can do, different diet changes that you can make. So stay with me to the very end because I'm going to be giving you some of the best pearls, some of the top pearls that I see work in my clinic for people who struggle with chronic pain. So without further ado, let's dive in. Now, We'll talk first a little bit about general pain, and we're gonna talk about supplements first, and I wanna talk about some of the mechanisms of, of why these are important. Now, some supplements you wanna take on a regular basis. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna highlight omega-3 here first. Omega-3, this is one that's so deficient in so many people's diets because most people don't eat enough cold water fish, and a lot of you probably aren't eating, um, if, you, if you aren't eating enough grass-fed beef or grass-fed meats and some of you if you're buying conventional meats you're not getting the omega-3 that you need and so understand what omegas do especially three they regulate inflammation this is why they're so important now research i learned this when i worked in the va hospital in the rheumatology department you know almost well it's 21 years ago now so Research showed that omega-3 fats were actually as effective and in some cases more effective at mitigating pain than non steroidal anti-inflammatories. So if you take drugs like ibuprofen or even aspirin, and, you know, there's Celebrex and naproxen and a number of what are called, again, non steroidal anti-inflammatories, NSAIDs, if you will, when compared to Omega-3, they're not as effective um, for several reasons. One, omega-3 naturally regulates the inflammatory response. So we want that natural regulation more than we want that synthetic inhibition because the synthetic inhibition causes folate, vitamin C, and iron deficiency. So one of the problems with that, if we're talking about general pain, especially as it relates to your joints, is folate, one of its primary roles is in the formation of cartilage. Same thing with vitamin C, it's in the formation of collagen, uh, which is very important. If you're not, if you're deficient in these nutrients because you've been trying to synthetically reduce your pain this way, you end up here with weaker collagen. You end up with an inhibition on your cartilage formation, which of, of course is gonna increase the risk for the development of arthritis and other types of pain. And of course, iron deficiency uh, leads to anemias. And so one of the sources of generalized pain is reduct, reduction of oxygen, O2. Remember anemia, which is a lack of the ability to carry the oxygen through your red blood cells to your muscles, your tendons, your, your joints, etc. You don't want that anemia because that lowered oxygen level will increase lactic acid production. Now, if you've ever gone to the gym and worked out and your muscles burned because, it, uh, because of this formation of lactic acid, some people have that pain, that lactic acid pain all the time because they're anemic. This is one of the reasons, again, why anemia can cause chronic generalized pain. So again, if you're manipulating your pain with these over-the-counter or even in some cases prescription drugs, this is the consequence, you don't want that. I mean, this is where omega-3 plays a major, major role. Again, studies show that it's as effective as these others, but you gotta get the quantity right. So, you know, two grams per day, and it should be what you take, you wanna make sure has a lot of EPA in it. A lot of the omega supplements focus on DHA. It's very, DHA right now is very popular uh, because DHA, DHA, what we sometimes call brain fat, um, a lot of people are taking it for cognitive function, a lot of people are taking it for Alzheimer's prevention, and so a lot of the products, these over-the-counter products, don't, they have a lot of DHA, but they're lacking 
EPA. So you want one that is a good combination of EPA and DHA, two grams a day. And this is something that I personally take every day. I take two grams of omega-3 every day supplementally in my diet because I'm not a big fish fan. I just don't care for the flavor or the taste. Um, and so again, this is something I would recommend every day. Now, if you're looking for something that's gluten-free, check out Omega Max. If you don't have a gallbladder, check out Ultra Omega. These are our two formulations um, that we recommend that are concentrated EPA, DHA, gluten-free, um, and one designed, again, uh, for just general health. The other one designed for people that don't have a gallbladder because of the fat malabsorption issue um, where we add some enzymes in it to help that that absorption of that omega-3. So omega-3, in my opinion, one of the top that everyone with, uh, with chronic pain or general pain should be using just supplementally to get that inflammatory regulation control. So next, I want to jump into, so I want to talk about vitamin C and quercetin. Um, these two specifically, you want to combine them You want to combine them because together they work synergistically. They, in other words, if you take in just one by itself, it won't work as well. So combining vitamin C and quercetin, when you do that, the, the biochemistry of vitamin C and quercetin, it works in the same area of the cells as steroids. So if you've ever heard of somebody taking like a corticosteroid for pain, sometimes like prednisone would be an example of that. Um, Vitamin C mixed with quercetin works. It's, the sim it's a similar mechanism. It works on the same chemical. Um, and a lot of times what we do, clinically speaking, is, is we put people on high doses of vitamin C and quercetin to help them when they're trying, when their doctor's wanting them to wean off of their corticosteroids, we'll use these two to help them do that. But combining these two can be very, very effective for pain, especially inflammatory pain of your joints uh, and of your muscles. Now. If you're taking drugs like corticosteroids, you also want to be aware that they deplete vitamin C. <laughs> so again, here's the irony is that the steroid itself actually depletes one of the very nutrients that could help you regulate your pain, but not just vitamin C. Also, they deplete calcium. They deplete vitamin D. They deplete magnesium. And I'm talking about long-term use. I'm not talking about if you used like a, you know, used it for a week. Some people go on like a, what's called a steroid dose pack for a week and they start at a high dose and taper down. I'm talking about long-term use. People that are in chronic pain, that are in pain management clinics and their doctors have them on kind of a consistent corticosteroid or prednisone indefinitely. If you, if you do that, you're gonna end up with these major nutritional deficiencies. Now notice here, um, you know, magnesium is one of those things on the list for pain, and so is vitamin D. So again, the corticosteroids, they, they actually inhibit four of the nutrients that are on our top list for helping your body manage and regulate inflammation and pain. So it's important that you understand that, especially if you're on these drugs, because if you're on these drugs, you should be supplementing with all of these nutrients just to offset what the drug is doing, um, not even necessarily for the pain, but just to offset what the medication can actually do. So back to, you know, again, vitamin C and quercetin work synergistically. You want to combine them. When we're talking about quantity, a good starting place for vitamin C is about five grams for adults, and that's per day. Now what you want to do with that five grams is you want to split it up and divide it doses, because if you take five grams of vitamin C all at once, one, it might give you loose bowels or diarrhea, two, um, you're not going to absorb it as efficiently. So when you, when you, anytime you go higher than one gram at a time when you're taking vitamin C, the absorption rate of that goes down. So when you take a gram, for example, you'll absorb about 600 milligrams, which is 60% of that. So when, you take, when you're taking vitamin C in high doses, a lot of it is, is lost and you're not absorbing it. So this is why you want to use divided doses. So when you, when you take a gram five times a day, you're going to get the, the maximum amount of absorption. Because if you, if you take it in, again, if you take it in those higher multi-gram doses, what will end up happening is you'll lose that absorption of that vitamin C. Now the quercetin, 
four grams per day. Now, if you're gonna do this long, I don't recommend quercetin at four grams a day long term. This would be more for like an acute type of situation where you're trying to get some relief, but um, you know, two grams a day long term would be okay, but you, you start getting into the higher doses and there's some things that we, we start to get concerned about. Um, and so if you're taking high, high doses of this over long periods of time, it's a good idea to be monitored by your doctor. So let's move into the next one which is vitamin D. Now, vitamin D is super critical for a lot of different reasons um, as far as pain is concerned, but, but one of the biggest reasons uh, with vitamin D, vitamin D deficiency causes muscle pain. I mean, this is a very well-researched and very, very um, clinically very well proven. And so vitamin D deficiency all by itself can be a contributing factor to muscle pain, also to neuropathy. Uh, so if you're having neurological pain. Now, this is something that's super easy to check. There's a test you can ask your doctor to, to run, and that's called a 25-OH-D test. And, and so basic blood work, your insurance should cover it. You know, reference range usually on these tests is 20 to 100. A lot of times people will be in their 30s, low 40s on, on a test like this. This is too low. If you're, if you're in chronic pain, this is too low. And you, you want to get that up. You want to get, ideally, if you're in chronic pain, you, wanna, you want your level of vitamin D to be between 70 and 100. And so to, to accomplish that, you know, most adults are going to need somewhere between 8,000 and 10,000 international units daily. A lot of doctors are hesitant to prescribe vitamin D in, in adequate doses because they've, you know, there's this myth that because it's fat soluble, it's somehow toxic. And vitamin D, um, there's, to my knowledge, one case of reported toxicity, and that was an, an actual PhD nutritionist who was taking a million units of vitamin D a day. I believe it was for about a year. This is nowhere near a million units a day. Um, and, and it's a very, very safe dose. Unless you have kidney disease, if you've got active kidney disease or active scleroderma autoimmune disease, then you wanna to talk to your doctor about your vitamin D needs. But if you don't, it's perfectly safe and perfectly fine to take eight to 10,000 units IU per day and then have your D levels checked. Again, have those D levels checked in about three month interval to make sure that you're getting up to this 70 to 100 range. And once you're in that range, it's a lot easier to maintain it. You don't need these heavier doses to maintain it. But remember, one of the things about vitamin D is that inflammation depletes it. Your body burns through more vitamin D when you're inflamed. This is why a lot of times we'll see people with rheumatological arthritis or chronic pain arthritis, their D levels are so low because their body is using every ounce of vitamin D that it has in order to help put this inflammation into check. So people with chronic inflammation, and there's a test, if, you, if you're not sure whether you have chronic inflammation, I mean, being in pain is, is a pretty good indicator, but there's a test that you can ask your doctor to run. It's called a CRP. Specifically, HSCRP, that stands for high sensitivity C-reactive protein. And you really want this value to be at 0.9 or less. And uh, if you're, you know, if your CRP numbers are, you know, three plus, then that you're not going to correct your vitamin D with anything under this amount. Because um, I see a lot of doctors, again, I see a lot of doctors prescribe it, and they'll give like 2,000 units a day, um, and then they'll come back and recheck the vitamin D, and it's exactly the same. It didn't do anything to their vitamin D. It's because this person being chronically inflamed is not going to get a good correction because that inflammation will drive vitamin D lower and lower and lower. So... Vitamin D, very, very effective. You can get your levels tested, super easy to do. Ask your doctor. It's not a test that um, doctors oftentimes refuse people of. Uh, so there are a lot of the nutritional testing that I've recommended that you hear me talk about, doctors refuse to do. This is not one of those. This is one that is very easy to get it done. Your insurance will pay for it as well. So get it checked. If you're in chronic pain, again, you want your vitamin D levels checked. Uh, because it, again, it's something easy to do. CRP is something that's also easy to get them to order. So vitamin C, vitamin D, quercetin, we've talked about omega-3. Let's go on to turmeric. Now turmeric, 
is very effective anti-inflammatory. And one of the things I like about turmeric is the lack of, of really any significant side effects. Now, you can go too high of a dose. Certainly, some people take it too far for too long, and that's possible. Some people report stomach irritation with too much turmeric. But um, that's pretty rare as far as it goes. Now, if you're looking at a you know, meaningful dose, anywhere between 500 milligrams a day and 2,000 milligrams a day and this again this is this this higher dose so i'm just be clear with all of you it's not for long-term use if you're in chronic pain remember you can use natural things to help with it but ultimately your goal should be find the source right what is driving the inflammation what is driving the pain now if it's not trauma right because trauma sometimes is the source of the pain so you might sprain or strain something or pull a muscle you know or have a you know again a traumatic injury but you know barring trauma this, so again trauma is a really good time to use some of these higher doses of things i'm talking about because you're trying to in, in an acute situation you're trying to improve the quality of the pain or the or the quality of your life by helping with the pain. But if you've got a chronic autoimmune inflammatory situation, to stay on this indefinitely as a crutch or a Band-Aid is not the greatest of ideas. You really want to figure out the source of the pain. And we'll talk more about that here in just a minute. Magnesium is another good one, especially for those of you who have cramping or muscle pain. Magnesium is Mother Nature's muscle relaxer. So it can be very, very effective as a muscle relaxer to help reduce cramping and muscle pain. Now those, you know, a lot of people have that like leg cramping, shoulder cramping, eyelid twitching. These can all be signs of just physical signs of magnesium deficiency. But magnesium, pretty safe to take for most folks, 600 to 1,000 milligrams a day. Even at these doses, pretty safe to take, especially um, those of you who might be on certain kinds of medications known to deplete magnesium. Now, I talked about corticosteroids earlier depleting magnesium, but if you're on blood pressure medicines, most of those, the diuretics like hydrochlorothiazide, the uh, Lasix, those types of medications deplete magnesium. And so this is, you know, we see this a lot in, in patients that have high blood pressure and they've been on their medication for years, um, we see their magnesium stores really, really low and that leads to or can lead to chronic pain situations that now we're using magnesium to correct what the medicine created and so that can be very effective. Okay, then we have glucosamine, chondroitin, MSM. I like to combine these three as um, you know, as a, as, a, as a, think of it as an all-in-one kind of a thing. Glucosamine chondroitin can help with collagen and cartilage uh, repair and formation, can help support that. And MSM is an anti-inflammatory, and it's very, very potent um, as an anti-inflammatory. A lot of people taste the sulfur-containing amino acid, basically, and um, can work wonders on somebody who's got chronic pain. So I like to combine these three Again, for acute, more for acute pain, not for somebody with chronic autoimmune disease or with somebody who's got chronic osteoarthritis where they've got a lot of wear and tear on their cartilage. Maybe they've been told that their, their, um, you know, that their cushioning in their joints is narrowed or it's diminished. This would be a really good indication for glucosamine, chondroitin, MSM uh, to be effective. Okay, let's move into... I think something you should all understand, because when I talked in earlier, so those are general things you can take for pain, but now we want to understand where does the pain come from, and so I want to share with you what we call the grain inflammation cycle. Grain inflammation, those of you who aren't familiar um, with gluten or with the components that are found in grain that are known to be major triggers of chronic inflammatory pain. So let's talk about some of those things. So a lot of people are familiar with this right here, this gluten, um, because it's had so much press and there's been so much research done. And doctors like myself, we've been talking about it for 20 plus years. So a lot of you are aware of this term. I mean, gluten-free 
is now a household word where 20 years ago nobody had ever heard of gluten really before. Now, so beyond gluten, we have all these other things that are found in grain. Because one of the arguments I, I hear a lot of people say is, well, grains are great sources of fiber. Grains are great sources of vitamins. Grains are, are necessary for human health. And all that's a lie. Grains are not necessary for human health. Um, we've been told that. And most of the grains that are sold in the store are processed grains, refined grains. Um, if, if you want to learn more about grain, as it relates to how unhealthy it can be for you, check out my book, No Grain, No Pain. But some of the things that come with grain when you eat grain is GMO, right? A lot of the grains that are grown today are genetically modified, particularly the, the corn. But a lot of the grains, are sp even if they're not genetically modified, they're sprayed with GMO pesticides. So that brings us to this one here, the, the pesticides like glyphosate. So when you're eating grain, you're getting GMO, you're getting pesticides. You also, there's a protein, a family of proteins in grains that are known to cause inflammation called ATIs. It stands for amylase trypsin inhibitors. And these have been really well studied to cause inflammation in leaky gut. We also have heavy metals that are found in grain. Um, what, what do we know so far? We know heavy metals have been found at high levels in corn, like for example, mercury. We know that cadmium and lead are very high in rice as well as arsenic. And so a lot of people who go gluten-free rely heavily on rice, and that's one of the problems with rice is you know, these heavy metals. And so especially if you're you know, 50 years old or older, you grew up in what we call the lead age. So you've already had your fill of lead. You were exposed to lead in the paint. You were exposed to lead in gas and children's toys and plumbing. And so now you know, making this a staple food is just adding to that excessive burden. Then we have excessive omega-6. Now, I was talking a minute ago about here about omega-3, right? And I said that omega-3 is very, very effective for pain. Well, think of omega-6 and omega-3. The average American has somewhere around a 16 to 1 ratio in their diets of omega-6 to omega-3. 16 to 1, meaning they're getting six, for every one, one gram of, uh, or six, they're getting 16 times more omega-6 than they are getting omega-3. Let's just simplify it and say it that way. Now, that being said, omega-6 and omega-3 are like two kids on a teeter-totter. And so, you know, if there's an equality of six and three, then those two kids on that, just like a teeter-totter, those two kids can kind of go back and forth and have a nice fun time. The average American diet, though, is the six is 16 times greater than the three. So imagine you got a super fat kid, you know, over here, and then you got a little tiny skinny kid on this side. And so what's gonna happen in that situation is uh, is not going to be fun for that skinny kid. It, it's the same thing that happens in your body. When your six is so great and your three is so low, what that does is it drives up inflammation, but it does something else as well. It increases the blood viscosity. So the thickness of your blood is increased, and this increases the risk for a number of different types of cardiovascular problems, heart attack, stroke, uh, easy clotting, things of that nature, which Again, we're trying to avoid. I mean, think about it. You know, if we look at one of the primary uses of medication in the modern world today is to control risk factors for heart attacks and strokes. And one of the easiest ways to control risk factors for heart attacks and strokes is to balance this ratio, okay, this 6-3 ratio. So what do we want it to be? We want it to be ideally, ideally we want it to be 1 to 1, but 4 to 1 is acceptable. But when you eat grain as a staple food, so coming back to what we were talking about, there's no way you're going to achieve an omega-6, omega-3, 4-1 ratio or less. It's, it's almost impossible to do when grain is a staple in your diet. So that excessive omega actually drives an increased thickness of your blood and it drives, uh, it drives you toward a, a heightened level of inflammation. We also know that grains are oftentimes contaminated with mold as well as mycotoxins. Now, mycotoxins are very, very dangerous. They inhibit DNA and RNA formation. They're, they're primary drivers of certain types of cancers. 
So we don't, we don't want to expose ourselves to that if we can stop it. We also know that grains, you know, again, if, you have a, if your diet is staple grain, it's ex- that excessive carb, what's it going to do? It's going to drive up risk factors for heart disease. You know, one of the things that excessive carbohydrates cause is triglyceride elevations. Let me spell that right for you. And triglycerides are, um, are fat that float in your bloodstream. And, that, you know, this is one of the major causes or contributing factors to people that develop fatty liver disease because your body is very, very efficient at taking excessive carbohydrates and converting them into triglycerides. But we also have a diabetes epidemic in most industrial countries. And so excessive carbohydrates are a primary driving force behind that epidemic. And, of course, that causes an increase in inflammation. We also know that leaky gut, grains cause leaky gut in multiple different ways. Pesticides can cause leaky gut, gluten can cause leaky gut, ATIs cause leaky gut, mold and mycotoxins cause it, heavy metals cause it. So leaky gut is a consequence of that. Now when that happens, and you, this is grain, right? We put all that into the funnel. What do we churn out of that funnel? Well, we end up with inflammation, hence the term grain inflammation cycle. Once you start the inflammatory process, what typically the next input for most people, they're in pain, they go to their doctor, what do they get? They get prescription drugs. They get things like steroids, things like non anti inflammatories, even as much as drugs like, uh, like opiate drugs or medications to manage their pain. I mean, pain management is a multi, multi-million dollar industry, right? And a lot of that industry could be shut down completely if people would change their diets and get out of this cycle. But one of the things that also happens when we have the inflammation is we get an increase in cortisol response. So the cortisol goes up. A side effect of cortisol going up is muscle loss. Remember, cortisol is a catabolic steroid. That means it breaks down your body's tissues, particularly your muscle tissue. Now, high cortisol over time causes high blood pressure. High cortisol over time causes blood sugar to go up. So again, these are two of the major risk factors for for heart attack, stroke, diabetes, et cetera. So all because of inflammation, right? That cortisol response can be very, very detrimental. And this is another reason why people that are in pain management, then their pain is being managed by steroids, end up developing weight gain, high blood pressure, high blood sugar, and eventually diabetes. And as I remember, as I shared with you before, these same drugs, even if your body's reproducing them, is gonna deplete your vitamin C, your calcium, your magnesium, and your vitamin D levels. And so that in and of itself becomes a problem because if you recall, you know, a lot of the things we said were helpful for pain are those very things. The vitamin C, the vitamin D, the magnesium, all can be depleted again by steroids. So once we get cortisol response, muscle loss, we start seeing weight gain. And it's the wrong kind of weight gain. It's not It's not the good kind, it's usually the central fat, the fat around the midsection, which is the most inflammatory and it's the most dangerous. And when people gain weight, one of the things that happens physically is joint compression and wear and tear of the joints. So we get inflammation that can cause joint pain directly, um, but then we also get the weight gain that causes the compression with the wear and tear on the inflammation. And this cycle just continues on and on and on Why? Because of diet. This is why diet has got to be your top priority strategy. You can take all the supplements in the world, but if you don't change your diet, you're going to end up in trouble. So those of you who don't know or haven't read, good homework assignment is get your copy of No Grain, No Pain. You can check it out at the library if you can't afford it. It's free at the library. It's you know, relatively inexpensive and probably one of the best investments you'll make if you're trying to get pain under control because the diet itself eliminates a lot of the foods that we know contribute to inflammatory processes within the body that drive the pain mechanism forward. So you got to change your diet. If you don't change your diet, all the supplements in the world are going to be bandages and you're going to spend a fortune in pills and not still not get better and still not get the results you want. Now, in addition to diet change, this has got to also be prioritized. Remember, the body works, when it comes to pain, the body works on a fundamental premise. And I know you've heard this before. Use it 
or lose it. When, when you are in it, when, just like I said before, when you have chronic inflammation, go back to the diagram here. Chronic inflammation increases cortisol. What do we say about cortisol? It causes muscle loss. Well, what else causes muscle loss is lack of utilization, right? Sedentary behavior. This is why use it or lose it is an important concept to understand. When you don't exercise, you lose muscle. You add to that a bad diet that creates inflammation and more cortisol production, you lose even more. When your muscles shrink, they cause a tightening impact on the joints. And so now when you go and try to move, it can actually hurt. And this is where people get stuck because they say, I try to exercise, but I can't because when I do it, I hurt everywhere. This is why you have to do this. You have to do slow, incremental exercise to tolerance, but you cannot just shut this down with pain as being your excuse. That means you've got to get into some kind of a program, maybe get a trainer, maybe hire a chiropractor or a physical therapist to walk you through different strategies so that you can increase your motion and movement, you know, if, it, if need be slow, if need be to tolerance so that as you start small, you can build your way up slowly over time and you can start waking up your joints, your muscles, your tendons, your nerves, etc. Because remember, when you don't use it, you lose it. Your joints specifically don't have a direct blood supply. The way they are nourished, the way your cartilage rebuilds and gets its nourishment is through motion, through movement. That's why people that sit at desks all day, their knees ache, their joints hurt. Um, because they're not moving them, they're not getting adequate blood supply, they're not getting adequate oxygenation and nutrients into that cartilage tissue, so it deteriorates at a faster rate. We learned this decades ago. The orthopedists used to tell people with back pain to go to bed, like to lie down and rest, right? And so they'd put people on this lengthy bed rest, and what they learned is that bed rest causes atrophy atrophy of the muscles, atrophy of the body, and that the atrophy actually led to increased pain and increased disability. And so movement is life. Motion is life. You've got to get moving again. So I know some of you watching this may be hurting quite a bit. You may be in quite a lot of pain. And so movement might seem relatively challenging for you right now, but start somewhere. My point is, start somewhere, even if it's slow, even if it has to be done to, to a small degree of tolerance. You know, there's this, PBS used to have run this show, uh, what was it, I think it was Sit and Be Fit. And so what it was is an elderly woman who would sit in a chair and she would just move. She would just show general movements, move your arms up, down, rotate them, lift your legs a little bit. Like that's the kind of thing you may be finding yourself where you have to start here and that's okay. Start with something. Don't give your excuse to do nothing because that's where you're gonna really find that atrophy is gonna increase your pain and your disability and then it's just gonna become the excuse. So you've got to get back to motion and movement. And so going back to um, that first slide, what will help you get back to motion and movement, hopefully with less pain and more tolerance as you start to move, are these things. And that's why we talk about them. So if you're struggling and you need a little bit of help, you know, consider taking some of these things if you're that person who finds yourself really struggling to be able to exercise due to pain. So use the nutrition to reduce some of your chemical pain so that you can start with movement because movement will have another impact on your pain. Okay, let's talk about a couple of key things that uh, you know, I know a lot of you may struggle specifically with joint pain. Now, there are different kinds of joint pain. There's wear and tear, so we got, you know, the wear and tear is what we would typically consider to be osteo, arthritis, what doctors oftentimes refer to as aging. I don't agree with that. I think aging is not an excuse. I think uh, most people's osteoarthritis doesn't happen as a result of the years going by. Most people's osteoarthritis develops 
because they're not using their tissue, disuse, right? And so disuse causes atrophy, atrophy causes compression, compression causes more wear and tear. The disuse is where a lot of that begins. Now trauma can do it too, um, but specifically, you know, severe trauma. So like if you broke a bone or you really, really had a major injury or accident, you could have some you know, wear and tear that never properly healed fully after an injury and that and that's you know where aging has nothing to do with that. So but joint pain specifically, I've listed out over here on this side of the screen some different supplements that may help tremendously with joint pain. And one of them that really oftentimes is overlooked is this right here. Most people don't eat collagen in their diet. Years ago people used to make you know, it's, it's made a comeback here in recent years, but years ago, people would pressure cook the bones and pressure cook parts of the animal uh, that was very rich in collagen, pressure cook those down into a kind of almost like a gelatin, if you will, and that would be used in soups and stews that would be used to make gelatin and, uh, and, and it, because it's rich in collagen. And collagen is a very, very important protein that is required to produce cartilage and, and tendons and ligaments. So the structures around your joint require collagen for their formation. So collagen as a supplement can be very, very helpful. I personally like to put collagen in coffee if I'm gonna drink coffee or even in tea um, because it mixes really well when you mix it with, a warm, uh, with warm water and it blends in really nice and it's relatively flavorless, but it gives your coffee or your tea, a kind of a creamy consistency. So it's a really easy way to get it in in, in your day. Um, some people put it in smoothies or just drink it in water, but you know, if you're already doing these two things, it's a real simple thing to add. We also have magnesium, which I've talked about already. Magnesium is very critical for cartilage formation. So you, you, know, you can't form and make collagen without magnesium. Magnesium also acts as a natural muscle relaxer. So muscles are tight around the joints, then it will compress the joints creating pain. And a lot of people develop joint pain because of muscular tightness or muscular imbalances. So this, this makes magnesium a good friend. Now you can take supplemental magnesium. You can also use Epsom salts or magnesium baths. Some people also use magnesium sprays. All these are effective ways to get more magnesium into your life. Uh, you know, beyond food. Of course, you should try and shoot for eating food that contains high levels of magnesium as well. Electrolytes. This is a big one for those of you that exercise that are struggling with chronic pain. A lot of times with athletes, particularly, we'll see dehydration be a chronic issue because of the, ex the exercise, this increases the sweating and so sometimes these athletes won't get adequate rehydration. And so adding electrolytes to water can be very, very helpful. Um, you can also use things like red salt or sea salt or Himalayan salt and add that salt to your food because that not, and I'm not talking about, you know, the classic grocery store sodium chloride, you know, the chemically washed salt. I'm talking about natural forms of salt to put in your recipes, to put in your food is a very good idea because in natural salts like that, you also get electrolytes. Now I've already talked about these three and, and my opinion on these three. So I'll just reiterate, glucosamine, chondroitin, and MSM are fantastic if you're struggling with a, with a chronic osteotype of arthritis and you want to give the support back to your joints. This is a great way to do it. And one of the most effective ways I see clinically for people to get benefit long-term. We also have nerve pain. And um, nerve pain is a little bit different than musculoskeletal pain because this is generally, it's in the nerve itself. So, I mean, there's a lot of examples of nerve pain that people struggle with. You know, you've got carpal tunnel would be an example of a nerve problem. A lot of people have, you know, tunnel surgical, uh, surgical reduction of the carpal tunnel where they'll go in and they'll, they'll cut in and they'll open that tunnel up, which is not always necessary. I think the surgery is performed a lot more than what's necessary. But that's an example of a form of, of, of nerve pain. And then you have neuropathy in general. Neuropathies, I mean, you can get numbness, tingling of the hands and feet, num numbness and, and tingling in any aspect of the body, really. You can also get sharp shooting, stabbing pain. 
neurologically. There's a number of different nerve points throughout the body, like the brachial plexus, uh, and then in the low back, you have the, the nerves that exit from the spinal cord and the sacral nerves. Like any of these impingements can create neurological types of shooting pain. And so with that type of pain, these things, in my opinion, are some of the most effective ways. And oh, let me add one other thing up here, and that's diabetic neuropathy. And then I'll also just add one more, nutritional neuropathy. Because a lot of people don't realize that nerve pain can be caused simply by not having this right here, B vitamins. This is, you know, this is true of diabetic neuropathy because high levels of carbohydrates deplete B vitamins. It's also true of just nutritional deficiency neuropathy because not getting adequate quantities of B vitamins in the diet can contribute to neuropathy. You see this a lot specifically in, in, in um, strict vegans who do not supplement. Um, you know, vegans have a really hard time getting adequate B12 and, and even vitamin B6 in their diet. And if they're not supplementing their diet with B vitamins, a lot of times it's very easy for them to begin to develop nutritional neuropathy. And, and this can manifest in a lot of different ways. It doesn't have to just be pain, numbness, and tingling in the hands, feet, or extremities. It can, it can actually also affect the brain. And so it can cause cognitive decline and, and uh, brain fog, loss of, uh, loss of the ability to think, and, uh, and that's not a good place to be. So keep that in mind. If you are on a vegan diet or a plant-based diet and you're not supplementing with B vitamins, it's something you're definitely going to want to consider. Now, beyond that, B vitamins are necessary, particularly B12 and B2 help produce myelin, which is the, the insulation that wraps around your nerves. And then you also have vitamin B1, which makes the, the neurochemical acetylcholine um, B5 is also helpful for, for production of acetylcholine. So those two go in with that. And then you have vitamin B6, and vitamin B6 uh, helps with dopamine and serotonin, neurochemicals in essence, and also with a, adrenaline and noradrenaline. Um, so you need these B vitamins. Folate is, is another one. Folate helps also here with myelin. So trying to be inclusive of them all, right? So the B vitamins are so important in neurological capacity to function, and that's why deficiencies of B vitamins lead to so many types of neuropathy. So if you're struggling with a neuropathy and it's non-traumatic, you didn't get an injury, it, it just set in, think B vitamins first. Always think B vitamins first, um, and this is especially true of those of you who are diabetics, because a lot of the medications for diabetes we, which we didn't mention yet, but one of the primary meds that doctors prescribe for diabetics is a drug called metformin. And metformin causes B12, folate, and CoQ10 deficiency. Um, and so, you know, these three nutrients, when low, can cause neuropathy. So, you know, you're on this drug for 10, 15, 20 years to manage diabetes because you're not managing it with your diet and lifestyle and you end up developing these deficits, and these deficits end up causing uh, these neuropathies, and these neuropathies end up inhibiting your capacity to have a quality life, and now you're not moving as much because you're in more pain, and so then with diabetes, you're deteriorating at a much faster rate. So um, again, B vitamins, what you want to look for. Now, hemp, you know, a lot of people are talking, it's all the rage, right, CBD, cannabidiol, um, this compound can be very, very helpful for people that struggle with neurological types of problems. This is especially true of neuropathy, but also remember that migraines are a form of neurological pathology or neuropathy. So, you know, CBD can also be extremely helpful if your problem is neurologically oriented. So if you haven't tried that, now there are different kinds of CBD um, and anywhere from 10 to really to 50 milligrams uh, of CBD is, is the, the range or the dose that I've seen be very, very helpful for those who are struggling with neurological pain. And then there are also, with, with CBD, there are also roll-ons where, where you can you know, roll it onto your skin or creams you can rub onto the skin and it can soak in and it can also be very, very effective for some people who have severe neuropathy. Magnesium, 
we've talked about a number of times, magnesium is required for nerves to be able to transmit messages, and so magnesium deficiency can also cause disruption of nerve communication leading to neuropathy. And then alpha-lipoic acid, this is one of my favorites if you have this up here. Been research studies on alpha-lipoic acid that actually show higher doses of alpha-lipoic acid in some cases dramatically improve or even reverse a diabetic neuropathy you got to get the dose right and so anywhere uh, upwards of over a thousand milligrams a day would be you know a good place to start with that and then you have theanine GABA and 5-HTP these are all neurological calming agents so a lot of times doctors want to prescribe a medicine called gabapentin for nerve pain, people that in pain management that are taking gabapentin. The problem with gabapentin is it slows down the GI tract. And, and in, for many people, you know, the side effect that the cost of taking it is severity of constipation, which you don't want because constipation is going to cause gastrointestinal problems. If you've got leaky gut, it's, it's, you know, it's going to create a bigger mess for you. So anytime you take a medicine that can affect how the gut does its work, remember the gut's job is to digest and absorb the nutrients from the food that you eat. And if you're starting to interfere with that through the use of chemical manipulation, you can get into trouble in other ways. So I've seen where people didn't want to use gabapentin due to you know severity of side effects do really well with things like theanine GABA and 5-HTP so again these are natural options if you will for those of you who struggle but don't want to get you know don't do well with this and have the severity of constipation that, that is caused by it so those are all simple nutritional strategies that you should embark upon should you struggle with pain I want to emphasize though Coming back to this, the number one thing that you should be focusing on is diet change. Diet change, diet change, diet change. Most people have chronic inflammation because they eat food that causes chronic inflammation. So remember the cycle, let this sink in. Now, if you have acute pain, there's one other thing that I didn't mention that I think I should because this, this is something in, in my toolbox, my arsenal, that I think um, you should tap into because it, it, it's probably one of the most effective ways to deal with acute injury or acute pain. Again, not, not long-term use as a crutch, but to deal with an acute issue. And that's combining white willow with boswellia. Um, these two things here if you, well, I won't get into the chemistry, but um, you know, there's, there's a couple of different chemicals in the cell membrane that are produced when there's injury and there's inflammation. And so these two chemicals are acted upon by both white willow and boswellia. When you combine them, there's a synergistic effect. I have used this formula for, gosh, for 20 years now clinically, and I've been able to get people off of their opiate medications, people who were in long-term chronic pain management clinics who were really, really struggling because, again, the side effect of those opiates, those aren't fun either, um, but they completely shut off and shut down the bowel. But combining these two things can be very, very effective at reducing inflammation and controlling or helping you to control pain. Remember that aspirin comes from white willow. The problem with aspirin is, you know, 7.5 milligrams, which is the tenth, a little less than a tenth of a dose of a baby aspirin, can cause gastric damage. So I don't recommend long-term use of aspirin. Now, a lot of people, their cardiologists will say, you know, take an aspirin daily, right? And so now you've got this, this major problem with with gastric damage and intestinal bleeding potentially and loss of, uh, of iron through that blood loss, which leads to anemia and more pain. But white willow doesn't do that. White willow doesn't, doesn't do that. So to me, this you know, similar mechanism of action without the side effects, it's natural. 
Um, and when you combine it with Boswellia, which is a, a lipooxygenase inhibitor or a LOX inhibitor, that, that can be extremely effective as the combination for acute pain. So let's say you were exercising, you injured your shoulder, or you were out running and you twisted your ankle, like this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about. You've got that acute pain. Um, I, have, I have a formula called White Willow Complex which has these ingredients in it, and it's something I would encourage you to check out if that's what you're struggling with and you're looking for a natural way to support your body's ability to handle it. Okay, hopefully I've given you some really solid strategies for management of, of pain naturally. Again, the most important thing you can do is diet change. Next, we're gonna be taking all of your toughest nutritional questions, and if you've got questions you'd like to write in with, Make sure you send those to glutenology at gmail.com. Welcome to the Answer Zone. Your questions, my answers. Uh, please don't consider any of this medical advice, but we're trying to give you some guidance and some places where you can begin to have meaningful conversations with your doc. So let's dive right in. Martina asks, for how long after accidentally ingesting gluten does the body produce antibodies? Simple answer, two to three months. Um, the, the research on this uh, points closer to that two month mark than that three month mark. And this is why you'll commonly hear me say that, um, that gluten the size of a breadcrumb can cause inflammation for up to two months. Now, what I'll do is I'll put a link below this where you can go read about the scientific breakdown of how the body reacts to gluten and how long gluten can stay with you and how long you can produce antibodies. So thanks for writing in with your question. This next one from Penelope. I continually have sore feet, including neuropathy and arthritis in my toes, plantar fasciitis, uh, low back pain and hip pain. I'm stiff and sore 24-7. I do foam rolling for fascia release. I don't know what to do next. Help, please. Now, Penelope, of course, you're already following the no grain, no pain diet. And so you're, if you're still struggling, the number one thing that you can do if you're still having chronic pain is to get your nutritional levels tested. A lot, especially with neuropathy, a lot of neuropathies are persistent B vitamin deficiencies. And so it could be B12, it could be B5 or folate or vitamin B1 deficiency that's contributing to that. And so you'd wanna get those levels measured. Now also, part two to that would be to get food sensitivity testing done. You might be reacting to some of the other foods. So if you've cut grain out and you're following the no grain, no pain diet, and you're still struggling, there could be some key foods you're continuing to eat that are playing a role as a trigger to your persistent pain. Christina wants to know, what changes can we do to improve an autoimmune disease if you're on a low budget? So, great question. Look, if you, if you wanna try to conquer autoimmune disease, number one, read No Grain, No Pain. All right, I wrote this book to help people navigate through recovering from autoimmunity using diet and lifestyle. And it's an extremely, extremely effective method. Um, so let's talk about, so beyond the book, right? Because the book you can go pick up at Amazon, you know, eight or nine bucks. Um, you can even, if, you, if you're really on a low budget, you can go to your library and you can check it out. But I'm gonna give you seven things that you can do right now for free. Number one, eat only real food. So regardless of food allergy, regardless of gluten or not, um, real food would be the thing that you want to eat. So no processed packaged food. Number two, go to bed. Be asleep between the hours of 10 p.m. and 2 a.m., preferably longer on both sides, but you need sleep to heal and repair. Number three, move your body every day. Depending on what level of disease you have, what level of pain you have, remember exercises to tolerance, but you gotta move your body. It needs movement to heal and repair. Number four, Fresh air, go outside, get sunshine, and that's number five is sunshine. So you need clean air and you need sunshine to heal and repair. So number six is drink plenty of fresh, clean water. Your body is 60 to 70% water, and if you're not drinking adequate amounts, your detoxification process will slow down, it'll make it harder to heal. And then the last, number seven, 
is you need to make sure that you surround yourself with positive influences, people who love you, uh, and, and check your relationships because a lot of time people are surrounded by grief. They're surrounded by um, they're surrounded by negativity, and that type of energy can really, really delay the healing process. So do those seven things. None of them cost you any money that you're not already spending, and you might just see your autoimmunity start to turn around. So TV shows, that's a, that's a tough one. I, I, I do like some shows, but the problem I've had here recently, maybe some of you could chime in as well and share your experience, but um, a lot of these uh, streaming platforms have really pushed what I would call an, an anti-agenda down our throats. Like it's really, really hard to watch movies that don't um, just push propaganda, whether it's political propaganda. Like when I'm watching TV, I don't want politics. I don't want uh, the flavor of the day being, you know, pushed or forced down my throat or my family's throat. And so I, when I watch TV, I just want to watch a good show with a good story, probably like many of you. And so I've had a really hard time of late finding really good stories. But one show that I have found uh, that I'm really enjoying, it, it's a series and it's a, several seasons, is called Yellowstone, if those of you are familiar with it. Kevin Costner. Uh, does a fantastic job of, of creating a, a kind of a backdrop and a, and a realism of, of, uh, of ranching. And I think it's important that people recognize uh, ranchers as, uh, as important folks and people with important jobs in this country. They bring us the meat that so many of us need to sustain our health at, at great cost uh, and at great hard work for themselves. And so this show kind of illustrates a lot of that, but it also weaves in a, a great storyline. When you know, One of the things I like to see is I like to see good triumph over evil. And sometimes it's, um, uh, it, it's shades of gray, so you don't, it's not necessarily somebody who's a prince or good and, and stands for all good things because nobody is perfect. Um, and this show does a really good job of, of giving you People that are good at heart that maybe do bad things, but uh, they're against really, really bad people who do all bad things. And so it's good to see good triumph over evil. I think that's what's been missing from a lot of TV and a lot of movies probably in the past decade. And this, this series does a fantastic job of capturing it. Hey, thanks for tuning in to Dr. Osborne's Zone. Make sure you join us every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. And don't forget to hit like and that subscribe button below. Once you hit subscribe, hit the bell so we can send you reminders when we go live to answer your questions and cover all your nutritional information every week.